Anybody got any questions this morning? Yeah, yes, sir, Mr. Joseph. It's interesting. Things seem to be running along a theme today. Um, but I was having a discussion uh, with a friend from work um, about proof that the Bible is the Word of God, and specifically about uh, the plan proving that it wasn't humans who wrote the Bible, it was God. Um, and he, he uh, asked the question, well, okay, so if the Old Testament was written to be replaced by a new religion, what would stop, you know, an intelligent Jew from, you know, noticing patterns, making up some parallels and drawing some parallels, and then writing the New Testament and saying, hey, there's nothing else going to be coming after this, you know, to preserve their made-up religion. And I, I didn't have, like, a, a, an answer that I was really satisfied with um, to give him. So what would, you, what would you answer in that situation? Yeah. Again, that's a great question because the, you know, obviously the New Testament does completely fulfill the Old Testament. And uh, so the question would be, okay, could a Jew, looking at the Old Testament... Just produce the New Testament by making it up out of thin air. Okay, that, that's really the, the question that's being asked here. Could, could a Jew looking at the Old Testament prophecies just produce the New Testament out of thin air? Well, it has some problems with that. Okay, so for example, did the guy Jesus really exist or is he manufactured out of whole cloth? Okay, well, of course, even Flavius Josephus you know, mentions in his, you know, um, book on the, on the Roman Wars, he mentions, you know, what the Latin would call crestus, um, you know, that was believed to have, uh, you know, died on the cross and have risen from the dead, okay? Um, you take a look at, uh, oh, um, the um, series trying to recall the name of the guy that, and his wife that wrote the, we got a complete collection downstairs, um, one of the great historians, you know, in his uh, book, Caesar and Christ, you know, he, he makes the point that uh, the, okay, at the time of Jesus, it was very clear that some guy that the early Christians believed, you know, died on the cross, was raised from the dead, and ascended to glory, and they were willing to die for that. Okay, so it's a matter of historical record that that belief was in place. Okay, now where did it come from? Okay, and in addition to that, we got the time factor. You know, if you use uh, passages like Daniel chapter nine verses twenty-four through twenty-seven, the uh, the um, you could actually pin it down to the exact year <coughs> that Jesus would be immersed. Uh, you could pin it down to the exact year when the crucifixion would take place. In fact, if you put a few scriptures together, you'd be able to pin it down to the exact day that Jesus' crucifixion would take place. Okay? Now, if you're manufacturing that out of a whole cloth, how do you have that happen? See, because I guarantee you nobody looking at the Old Testament, just with the Old Testament, without the New Testament, is going to see that in there. See, the Jews even struggle with the idea that, that the Messiah was going to have to die first. See, so the early preaching is that he had to suffer, see, in accordance with the scriptures. See, Jesus would say after his resurrection of the dead, it was written in the scriptures that the Christ had to suffer. See, they were not making the connection that, uh, that the Messiah would have to suffer. Okay, on top of that, the, the prophecies of the resurrection are pretty hidden, okay? In other words... Looking forward, you would not see the resurrection in those Old Testament prophecies. It's only looking backward. In fact, those, those prophecies were hidden so well that even the devil didn't see it coming. Okay? So, to, to try to say that, uh, that a Jew would look at the Old Testament and to be able to make it up and then to manufacture the history. Okay? So, <coughs> Jesus wrote into Jerusalem... Uh, on a donkey, in accordance with Old Testament prophecy, in the presence, I don't know, I got a picture of hundreds of thousands of people lying in the throngs. I mean, you've got to remember on the day of Passover, there had been three million people in town. 
Okay, so if a bunch of them come in early, so let's say 10% of them come in early, that's 300,000 people. You know, lining the, the route, you know, and shouting Hosanna to the king, Hosanna to the son of David. See, so you don't, you can't, you can't have a Jew making up that story. Now, on top of that, let's talk about the parables. Okay, you know, the kingdom of heaven, you know, is um, like a treasure hidden in a field. See, which a man found it hid, and then he went and sold everything he had, and, and he bought that field. Okay, uh, um, what, what's that mean? Okay, <laughs> see, so how's a Jew <coughs> going to make up that parable? without having the knowledge that the kingdom of heaven is going to be the church. See, nobody's anticipating the coming of the church or the kingdom of God or the temple of God, spiritual temple of God, or the bride of Christ, or, you know, the different terminologies that the New Testament. And nobody's anticipating the church coming into existence at all. Okay. And yet, it's easy to see from the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies looking back. Now, <clears throat> Are you going to manufacture out of whole cloth then the, uh, the existence of the, the crowds there on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people get immersed? You're going to manufacture out of whole cloth that happening? <clears throat> You're going to manufacture the history of the Apostle Paul, you know, appearing before Gallio, you know, the, the proconsul of Achaia, <clears throat> when we find coins? So you're going to manufacture those trials out of whole cloth? But, or the letters, okay? You're going to be able to man, you know, manufacture the names at the end of those letters and the personal greetings that Paul has? Are you going to manuf who's going to manufacture Revelation? <laughs> out of whole cloth. You know, I just, you know, I, again, I have in my collection, my proof that the Bible is the Word of God collection, I, I have a, a set of Cliff's Notes. You know, remember the Cliff's Notes is what you can go up to the university. You don't want to take the class. You mean you don't want to study for the class, so you just buy Cliff's Notes on the class and, and just read, you know, in a couple hours. And you know, we've got Cliff's Notes on the Old Testament and Cliff's Notes on the New Testament. See? And it's really interesting. Here's what Cliff's Notes said about Revelation. Some of you will recognize this. Revelation is comparatively easy to understand. In many respects, it's the least original of any of the New Testament writings. Okay, that's obviously an airhead statement by some philosophy professor, you know, at the University of Nebraska or something like that. See, but it's a, that, that's no more of an airhead claim than to actually say, okay, Let's take a look at this New Testament and say it was made out of thin air. See, because see, you start looking to details. It's similar. See, all these things are sales, okay, designed to sell you, okay? So if I'm going to sell evolution, you know, I'm going to skip over some of the foundational things, and I'm going to start showing you transitional forms. You know, I'm going to lay out on a table here uh, as best I can collect them the... Uh, you know, a set of, uh, of uh, fossils that show a, a transition from reptiles to mammals. And I'm going to get you to look at that. Um, I remember going to this, I think Jim Mitchell was with us. We went to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. Okay, you walk into the Smithsonian, they, you know, into the, you know, I guess we'll call it the evolution section. You know, and they got it all laid out, you know, primitive. I mean, you just kind of work your way up through the Smithsonian there, and yet they got it all laid out. I mean, very clearly, <coughs> you know, that's the way it was, you know. Well, just you just go back to some foundational questions. What's the possibility of human DNA, three billion lines of code, come together by accident? See, I just, that just, the, I mean, just like Caden's example of the the marked dollar in the middle of Texas, okay, somewhere out on the Llano Estacado, you know, supposed to blindfold it, you know, and dig exactly the right depth into that coin pile and <laughs> pull a quarter out. You know, not happening, right? 
What's the possibility of human DNA? I guarantee you it's easier to find that quarter than it is for the three billion lines of the human DNA to come into existence by accident. See, but they want you, they just want you to bounce right over the top of that and look at these transitional forms. See, that, that's how you sell things. See, you know, don't look under the rug. You know, uh, you know where's, where's the P going to be underneath? See, it's always don't look at what you're supposed to look at. Okay. So when we start looking at the details of the New Testament, who's going to make that up? You can make the grand statement that they made it up. But that's just like trying to get you to look at transitional forms. See, they're, they're, uh, you can, anybody can make these big statements, but the actual details of getting it done, see? So how are you going to get those details? How are you going to get a guy riding into Jerusalem on the donkey? How are you going to get a guy crucified? How are you going to get a guy resurrected? How are you going to have witnesses to a resurrection that didn't happen? How are you going to have a revelation from heaven after Jesus' resurrection from the day of Pentecost on that makes a comparison between the Old Testament temple and a spiritual one? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. See, that's the Old Testament talking about what's coming under the terms of the new covenant. Not possible. And so the key is, okay, let's start. Okay, you make the grand statement. Okay, let's start putting some details together. Let's see, is this possible? See, did anybody ever speak like Jesus spoke? See, you, you start looking at the things that he said. You realize nobody's making that up. Because to, today, how many people misunderstand the parables because they don't understand what the kingdom of heaven is? When they're thinking of a future physical kingdom, all those parables, they miss the meaning of them. So even with the parables there, and even with the parables interpreted, interpreted, the vast bulk of the public doesn't understand what Jesus said. So when you start putting that kind of details, maybe that'll help you, Joe. You got a comeback comment here? Okay, it's a great question. Other, other questions this morning? Yeah. No. Talking about the numbers and putting things together, almost uh, two years ago, I went to Midland, no, Mexico, uh, Missouri, to a, a um, place where they built, um, where they made the parts for kid airplanes. And you wander around the factory plant there and you pick up a triangular plate that's got 30 holes around there. Where does that piece go? <laughs> I mean, when you when you look at you know, with, without instructions, there's no way you're going to figure out where that piece goes on the airplane. See, again, that's a great point. If you don't if you don't understand the mind, you know, who would have to reveal it in the in the instructions. If you don't have the instructions from the mind who designed that triangular piece, you got no clue where it fits or how it's going to go. And you know, that's a great illustration of, in a simple way, physical way that we can sometimes get our hands on as to how the Bible's written. You don't, you don't understand what you're looking at unless somebody tells you what it is you're looking at. Yeah, great point. Other thoughts or comments? Uh, Phil. You know, as we're going back to start your study here in a, in a few minutes, uh, I was just thinking last week, you know, being from back east, um, usually these arguments that we're talking about as far as, you know, the ability to overcome the new creation, Usually, we only had to pull these out for those who were leaders or those who were particularly were actively fighting against it. Um, I thought that it was interesting that the general, um, we'll just say the general Christian, you know, who, who was not in leadership, who was not fighting against things, normally didn't even want to go in this direction. Uh, they, um, you, you would have some people who just, you could just tell they didn't want to follow the Lord and they weren't interested in it, but, it, but the part that I found the most interesting was that there are a number of people who were who were tracking, who were who were following along, but some of the problems that they had was 
some of the people that they knew who, uh, quite a few of the people according to them that they knew who would adhere to this, they were just actually not being nearly as faithful as the people around them. And uh, I remember one time you told a story about how you, you, you spoke with some people and said, if I came in here and I started drinking a beer and was smoking a cigarette and put my feet up, would you pay attention? And you said, you know, that's the whole concept of letting your light so shine, you know. And the Lord even talks about it over in Ezekiel 36, you know, um, us proving him and proving, you know, and vindicating his name and proving who he is by him creating a people who actually will keep, you know, his word and will keep its statutes. Uh, one particular person, a very, very honest person, uh, actually came out here and visited one time and said that one of the reasons that, that she struggled a little bit with it was because she, she found that a lot of the folks that she was talking to just weren't even, in her mind, weren't even as serious. They, were, they would do practices of things that she would never even consider because it dishonored the Lord, yet they're pushing this, and, and the people that she's around actually are, are living it more. The reason I'm even saying that is, um, you know, it's good to know the scriptures about this, I and mean, you need to know the scriptures about it, um, but there's enough scriptural evidence, and then you compare that to, to practical, that the thing that's going to convince the most honest person who's maybe really struggling with, I'm not sure if this is right or not, is to... Um, it's going to help them to kind of prove it with your own life. And so I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. The, uh, you know, the God expects us to be, you know, lights to the world, you know, salt to the earth. I mean, he expects us to exhibit to the very best we can, you know, what's Christianity. Of course, the ultimate idea is that we can walk in the footsteps of Christ. Okay. What do you do with a person who's a new Christian and who is a Christian who's struggling? Okay, I have a... I have a book on confe- uh, uh, perfection that was written by, uh, I think, uh, published by Oxford you know, Press in, in England, okay? And it was on the uh, seven perfectionist movements in history, okay? You know, okay, I, you guys, what? There's actually perfectionist movements, yeah. And uh, so, you know, the, the author is pretty interesting on that. I mean, he's just trying to be, uh, take an objective look. They almost always start in the Book of Romans, by the way. And, uh, but uh, the author's trying to take an objective look. And he said, you know, the, a lot of times the person who's looking at the perfectionist movement is asking the question, are any of you perfect? And, but he makes the point that that's not really the issue. You know, the issue is whether the scripture says it or not. And I found that to be a very, very interesting question, you know. uh, if a person is looking to, let, okay, let's say you want to criticize the church, okay? Now, everybody in here is, is walking perfectly and doing an awesome job. But some necessarily that aren't here this morning, and maybe they'll be here, um, we can pick on them because they're not here to defend themselves, right? Because that's how you do things is when people aren't here to defend themselves, right? Well, see, you can always find fault. Real? Or if you can't find a real one, you can make one up. Did they find fault with Jesus? They sure did. Okay, is it real? No. So we can help. I think that's the word that that Phil used. We can actually help the furtherance of the potential in Christ by living and increasing our our uh, our commitment to Christianity. you know, that's, that's our part. But ultimately, the bottom line is, does the scripture say it? And are people going to be willing to process that? If a person uses me, for example, as a means to diss the scripture, you know, because they don't like me or they don't like some of my actions or they don't like the way I say things. You know, I've had people say, I agree with what you said. I just don't agree with how you said it. Okay, well, how was I supposed to say it? <laughs> you know. I mean, it's easy, it's always easy, see, to find fault if that's what you're looking for. See? So, on the other hand, our goal is not to be in any way placing stumbling blocks in front of people. But the, the point is, is they're still going to have to process that. And so I appreciate those comments, Phil, because they're, you know, I mean, the goal is to help us as individuals say, okay, maybe there's an area in my life that I need to work on. Maybe an area in my life that I need to improve on. So, further thoughts or comments on any of that? Okay. 
Well, I think we can go ahead and start our slideshow. Okay. Uh, again, I've been working on some of the objections and some of the propaganda over our potential in Christ. And I've, I've got a couple of these. That's not the right one. Okay. So... I know that this is the one on glory. I know you guys don't have one here. Anybody else need one on glory? Okay. So the reason that this issue of glory is so significant, just a reminder, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in verse 18 says that we all, See, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And so the, the glory of Jesus, in other words, really the way the scripture would put it, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, the glory of God seen in the face of Christ is the only mechanism for the transformation of the inner man. And the thing is that that transformation of the inner man is a perfect transformation. In other words, the, when we're immersed into Christ, we are a new creation. See, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Uh, we have been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, there's actually a brand new being on the inside. Now, historically, the Restoration Movement... All the new creation is, is the old one forgiven. So you're basically the same rotten person making a couple improvements. Okay. <laughs> but see, that's, that's not what the scripture teaches. See, and again, I just want to use an example. Um, a year ago, I was able to be in New Zealand. And, uh, you know, at kind of a men's gathering there. And uh, I was talking with a young fellow from China. And because uh, they'd been saying... And these are all a cappella Church of Christ people from New Zealand and Australia that were there. And uh, the whole weekend was we're, we're sinners, we're sinners, we're sinners, we're sinners, we're sinners, okay? And then, then they couldn't figure out, okay, they always had division, ruckuses, you know, you name it. You know, all the you know, churches were continually going through that, okay? So that, of course, is a characteristic of the flesh, you know, Paul... Apostle Paul, when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, is the fact that there's strife and jealousy among you, is it not because you're fleshly and, and walking like mere men? So I was mentioned to the young fellow from China that, you know, there's a solution to this, and it's uh, found in concepts of the new creation, the gospel of glory, and worship. Okay. So he said, boy, I'd like to talk to you more about that. So he went and spent about, spent about three hours. Okay, next morning I'm having breakfast, and this Australian that's about a foot and a half taller than I am, uh, you know, uh, came over, and he said, I, I couldn't help but overhear your conversation last night. And he said, what did, you, what did you say those three points were? I said, well, you know, new creation, gospel, glory, and worship. He said, I don't understand how those would have any connection. And I said, well, you know, Ephesians 2.10 says that we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay. And I said, would you say that this new creation in the inner man was a sinner? See, and he kind of got a grin on his face and said, no, I wouldn't say so. I said, that's where we're going. So we were scheduled to go to Australia in October. But that's been canceled because of the, the whole virus thing. So you keep praying that we can get there. So, but that's, that's why this glory thing is so important because the glory is the transformation. That's, that's what creates the, the new creature in the inner man. Okay. So if you're going to deny then th that concept, then you have to attack glory. See, and that's what this whole last series of slides has been about is the attacks on glory from this guy named Chuck Dowdy from the debate and from his 
post-debate commentary uh, that he wrote. So that's kind of where we are. Is there any, any questions or comments on that so far? Okay, go ahead. The uh, first line here. The, uh, get my computer up to speed here. Okay, so the, uh, we're just talking about the gospel of glory. It could be translated glorious gospel. That, you know, as I mentioned, this Chuck Dowdy, he said it's the gospel that's glorious. Okay, why does he say that? Well, he's trying to deny the power of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So he's trying to make it the gospel that's glorious. Next line. See, the point of the scripture is what's being proclaimed is the good news of the glory of Jesus. In fact, you know, the gospel wouldn't have any glory at all if it wasn't for Jesus. Okay. Next line. So Dowdy does not want it to be about glory, and I just selected him. He's not, he's not atypical. I mean, he's, you know, he would be maybe a little bit uh, more vocal about it and maybe sometimes make some over-the-top statements that other guys wouldn't make. But um, his, you know, his, basically his viewpoint would be held in general. By the, by the restoration movement, okay? So Dowdy does not want it to be about glory. He wants the gospel to be only the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. He wants everything centered on the cross. Okay? In fact, as he said, the cross is the center of gravity. It's the redemption. And he said it's the propitiation. You know, some things that we talked about along the way. Okay? Last line here. See? But the point is, is to the extent that the gospel has glory, it's derived from the glory of Christ. Anything anybody wants to add to or comment on, on this? Okay, next slide. So here's Dowdy talking here. The first line here, he says, that Christ is on the throne cannot be denied, but his, that's God's most popular view, is not that of a glory-giving king, but the lamb on the throne. See, now what he's doing there is he's going to the book of Revelation, you know, and you've got a lamb there as if slain, okay? And so the point that Dowdy is making is, see, it's the lamb that's slain. It's the slain, see, he's going to use the slain going back to the cross to try to de-emphasize the, the glorious Christ on that throne. See, in other words, that's why he's going to talk about the lamb of the lamb being slain, because he's going to try to always make it about the cross. Now, okay, the fact that Jesus is pictured as the lamb as if slain, you know, he was, wasn't he? Well, is he still slain? Is, is Jesus still hanging on the cross? You know, is Jesus still standing next to the empty tomb? Is, is, is he still physically on his ascent to glory? How, who is the Jesus who is? It's the Jesus on the throne. Okay. Next line. The lamb on the throne, lamb, emphasize, um, uh, you know, what he means is emphasis on the lamb on the throne does not suit Wilson's fancy very well since he wants to get away from the cross and into this glory syndrome. Again, I hate to use, you know, I mean, I'm trying to represent him fairly. And so, you know, if he makes a few personal shots, that's okay. Um, you know, the point is, you see, that uh, he says that the lamb on the throne doesn't fit the concept of Jesus in glory. See, that is, okay, you know, that's short-circuited reasoning, okay? You know, I mean, let's just go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11, Okay. Revelation 20, verse 11, it says, uh, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence, from whose face heaven and earth fled away. All right? Well, who would that be on that throne? You know, Jesus said, you know, not even the Father judges anyone. But he's given all judgment to the Son in order that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. 
So who's on that judgment throne? Jesus. Even in Matthew 25, you know, that one of the parables is pretty thinly veiled about the king, Jesus himself, taking his seat on the throne and all mankind, and he's separating them into sheep and goats. He's putting the goats on his left-hand side, and he's putting the sheep on the right, right? Glorious throne? See, yes, there is a picture of the lamb as if slain, but that's not the only picture. See, the scripture doesn't want us to ignore the fact that Jesus died on the cross. That's where the love of God was demonstrated for a lost race in a way that couldn't be demonstrated any other way. But that's not where he stayed. See, so by his, you know, this is a technique that's often used. Well, look at this. Look at this. If you, if you look at this, that means you ignore everything else. No, that's not how it works. You've got to put it all together, don't you? Comments on this? Yeah, Nick. <laughs> A question. In Revelation 19, you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yep. And it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. What, uh, I mean, obviously the, it was the Lamb that was slain. Yeah. And this is a, if I'm understanding it right, it's a future reference to when the kingdom. Yep. Um, is accepted in heaven, right? Yeah. So it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb, yeah. which would to me signify that the Lamb that was slain is resurrected Correct. and in glory. Correct. And he has a problem? I, I'm not understanding his reasoning here. Yeah, well, it's, uh, that's good. <laughs> see, because it's, it's not correct reasoning. Okay, see, he's just trying to get you to focus on the Lamb slain to say, well, the glory thing doesn't mean anything. Lamb is, Lamb is in glory. Exactly right. Yeah, great point. Yeah. See, when, uh, when Jesus comes back, because he's still going to have the nail holes in his hand, he's still going to have the spear wound in his side. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people think that. You know, uh, when he comes back, I'll know him by the nail holes in his hand. That's one of the old songs, right? Yeah. You know, it's from his presence, whose face, earth and heaven fled away. When Jesus' glory appeared, it was going to vaporize the material universe. And there's no spear wound there, and there's no nail holes. See, because he's not a physical body anymore. See, when Jesus, when the cloud accepted Jesus out of the apostles' sight, from that point on, there's nothing physical there. You know, when you look at Hebrews 9-11, you know, how, how it talks about how Jesus entered into the true tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation. You think he's got a physical body when he's going into a spiritual temple? No, see, that, see it, make, it makes no sense. It's, I mean, Nick said, I don't get it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it, nice, it doesn't make sense if you're willing to process it. See. Further, further thoughts or comments here? Jerry? I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> Chuck would never teach, I, at least I never heard him teach, that um, Jesus was going to establish a thousand-year reign in Jerusalem. This thought process could only lead to that conclusion, though. Yeah. So he's, he's yeah. nuts. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, if you follow a lot of his thoughts, Sue, you know, you're going to go right back into Calvinism and premillennialism, exactly. Yeah, see... And again, if you look at Burton Barber's chart out there in the, in the main auditorium, and you look at premillennialism and predestination and all that, it's going to have the date on it, 400 A.D. Wait a minute, I thought Calvin was 1536. How come it's 400? Augustine. You know, the great Catholic theologian. See, I'm telling you, Gnosticism morphed into Catholicism, morphed into Calvinism. And underneath... It's all, you see, the Gnostics are developing at the end of the first century. I mean, John's gospel account, first, second, third John, all trying to expose the Gnostics for what they are. See, and, and the Gnostics 
See, they're, they're, they're battling with the same problem. Okay, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. I'm always going to be a dirty, rotten sinner. And the apostles were wrong when they were telling us that we couldn't overcome. And so they actually end up having to deny that Jesus came in a fleshly body in order to reconcile their thought. Because John wrote his letters, they had to change their tune. And that is that Jesus, well, he actually had a body, but he had a different body than we have. And that's where these guys are. See, they're just Gnostics. They morphed it slightly in order to duck the obvious statements of, of the Apostle John in First and Second John. But they're Gnostics. See, and that's why you're not going to find any different. See, in other words, the cycle repeats itself. You, you deny the concepts of the new creation, the gospel of glory of Christ, you're driven right down the same road that the Gnostics went. Exactly done. That's why this stuff is relevant. Because you think it's not going to happen again? It will. See, so you have to kind of mentally be prepared for the arguments. Uh, next line. A lamb on the throne still burying the scars of one having been slain for a sin does not help his cause at all. Still burying the scars. Okay. That's Chuck's? Yeah, right. Okay. What do you think, Nick? <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> Yeah, that's my cause, yeah. My cause for preaching that Christ in glory is where the action is, yeah. Okay, next line. So Daddy's going to define glory. So he gives what I call a backhanded definition here. It says, uh, to Wilson, glory does not mean that Christ glorified is one who is worthy of high regard, honor, esteem, and opinion. Okay. Again, you know, if I show somebody the debate, I have to stop and say, okay, here's what Chuck actually meant, okay? Yeah, you know, you have to try to understand his thinking. Now, okay, let's go to Acts chapter 3, and I'll use this as an illustration here. <coughs> A number of years ago, I was given a whole set of tapes by a guy named David Potter. I don't know if he, David ever came here to the Montana family camp. Some of you had a chance to go back east, probably met David. He was from Florida. And uh, they were from some professors at something called Florida Christian College. Now, Matt Hartford, he's a graduate of Florida Christian College, so Matt will be here this week speaking at family camp, okay? But I was listening to one of the professors preaching on the book of Acts. So going through, and I think I was driving across Indiana or someplace, in Acts chapter 3, then when Peter is, you know, talking to the crowd after they healed this guy, in verse 12, Acts 3, 12, when Peter saw this, that's all the people there, uh, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you go, uh, or gaze at us as if our, by our own power or piety we'd made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. So he's preaching on it. And he said, see, Jesus got all kinds of glory and honor. See, that's how he's looking at the word glorified there. It's, you know, same thought on the one. See, high regard, honor, esteem, and opinion. But that's not letting the scripture define glorified. Okay, let's, let's go to uh, John chapter 7 here. It is such a huge point. You know, you hear me stress all the time. You've got to let the scripture define scripture. <clears throat> and it will. You know, and some of the pieces of information are scattered from Genesis to Revelation. Like maybe God expects us to read this whole thing. Okay, but they're, you know, they're there. Okay, so John seven thirty seven. <clears throat> Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Of course, he's talking about, as he puts it here, this he spoke of the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit flowing from within. This he spoke of the Spirit, 
whom those who believe in him were not to receive, or who, who <laughs> believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glory, glorified. Now, did Jesus have honor, <clears throat> uh, high regard, esteem, and opinion while he walked in the flesh? Not by everybody, but certainly by thousands who followed him, right? Okay, but he, the scripture says he wasn't glorified yet. See, because the basic idea is in order to be in glory, guess what? You have to be glorified. Now, out of that can come a secondary meaning of high regard, honor, esteem, and opinion. Okay? But the thrust of Jesus being glorified is his actual ascension. If you look at John 8, I'll catch you in a second, Phil. <clears throat> See, he's really driving at this point here. Um, in verse 51, John 8, 51, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also. You say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. <clears throat> sure, you're, surely you're not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died. Who, whom do you make yourself out to be? See, well, in order for Jesus to be greater than Abraham, he's going to have to what? He's going to have to live forever. Okay? And Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God, and you've not come to know him. If I say I do not know him, I will be a liar like you, but I know him and keep his word said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Jews understood that properly. They said, You're not yet 50 years old, you say to Abraham. Jesus comes back with this tremendous statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. See, what's, that gonna, what's it going to take for that to happen? He's going to have to be glorified. He's going to have to be glorified, and that's when he gets the glory that he's talking about here in John chapter 8. Okay? So Phil's got to come in here. So glorified, you know, the primary thrust of it is Jesus ascending to glory. And of course the emphasis is glorified by God. And if it's just honored, you know, was Jesus not honored by God while he was walking here on, on the earth? It seems like I remember, you know, a couple of times, you know, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased, listen to him, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, so there's actually a glorification that, that, that means something that God did to Jesus, you know, and, and, and Jesus even talked about, you know, wanting to return to that glory. But I always like to go to, you know, Hebrews 5 there. It says, also Christ did not glorify himself as to become a high priest, but he who said this to him. So God is doing it. You know, you're my son today. I've begotten you. Just as you said in another passage, uh, you're a priest forever according to order of Melchizedek. You know, the whole concept is, um, you know, and then it says a little bit later, you know, the point to all this is that we have such a high priest who passed through the heavens. The whole idea is Jesus could not be, uh, in the ultimate sense, the uh, Christ, even though he was Christ on earth, but the Lord, um, but God made him both Lord and Christ as he's ascended and glorified. Uh, so he was the one while he was here on earth, and he was the one who was priest. He was the one, but he wasn't in that position as priest. And so something had to happen for, you know, for, for that to be. You know, so he had to be made the Christ because he wasn't completely the Christ on the earth in, in that sense. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't realized. He wa I have to be careful because this is recorded and everybody's going to say, Jesus, Phil said he wasn't the Christ on earth, but you, you know what I mean. And, uh, and the same thing about, about, about the priesthood, you know, he had to be in that position. And that happened through God glorifying him. And you read this, you almost have to, j just to turn off reason to say that this has to mean that God honored him and so he became the son on the throne as the priest. Yeah. Well, you, you keep those comments in mind down the road, Phil, when we start working on the blood, okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. For the comments here. Yeah, Jerry. I was just going to say that I have high regard, honor, esteem, and opinion, and I'll pick somebody that nobody can argue with, of Miss Keaty. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to worship her. Well, I try to give her glory. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> uh, but 
but I expect her to reverence me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point, though, Jerry. Okay, yeah. Sean? <clears throat> My mom and I were just reminiscing about this because um, we, of course, were there, and we remember a lot of, of the comments that were being made, and this is probably one of the hardest events for me to film because I could care less about what the camera was seeing and watching the camera because I was so intent on listening. But the electricity in the room was... Um, it was tense, but then it was um, really, uh, really a lot of fun because of he would make his points, and I wanted to film people, you know, rolling their eyes and, and kind of going, "What does that mean?" Um, and just, and then, you know, I think the moderator had to tell us to keep our applause, you know, stop applauding and, and, and stop cheering several times. But um, the one comment that Mom brought up to me that I had forgotten about was his entourage that came in with the computers and all the tables of books and all the research that he's done. It's evident that he has done a lot of it. Well, he, and then you show up with just the Bible, and I think he forgot to do research on this one. He did a lot of research with a, a lot of other books. Yeah. yeah, you were there, Sean. Like I say, we, and we appreciate Sean filming. It's his his film that we're able to put on DVDs, you know, for people who you know, want to take a look at that. So, you know, nice work, Sean. Yeah, good. For the comments here. Okay, next line. To him, that's Wilson here, it's the glory we get through participation with the risen Christ to live in this halo-headed, sinless, perfectionist life. Okay? I don't know if I need to comment on that one. Or not. <laughs> uh, see, next line. See, it's, uh, and again, I, I referenced this earlier, but in reference, this is my comment here. In Jesus' reference to living waters flowing from within the believer, the Apostle John clarifies, but this he spoke of the Spirit whom those who believed him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So, you know, pretty clear that the glory, when it talks about Jesus being glorified, that's talking about his ascension to the glorious throne. Next slide. So some concluding remarks here. This is going to just kind of finish off this uh, slide presentation here. Um, we, we started this talking about a guy named uh, Sherwood Smith and another one named Bob Scheffler. And again, these are all on the instrumental side. I could have pulled guys from the a cappella side as well, you know, that would say pretty much the same thing. See, it, it's, uh, it, the, the challenge of the argument is the same. I remember doing a new creation presentation one time for a bunch of guys in Christian churches. And... Uh, um, you know, here in the state, and they, they basically threw me out of the room, okay? And it wasn't too long after that that I met with the elders and preachers of the Church of Christ, you know, in Bozeman, you know, Belgrade, and, and Livingston at, uh, you know, the Bears restaurant there at the Fly and J. Stock, stock. So I did a new creation presentation, and they basically threw me out of the room too. See, for the same reasons, see? So there's a, my point is the underlying resistance here uh, when you start trying to move away from, quote, the cross. And, uh, again, uh, there was a guy that uh, came to family camp. I think it was the first year that Steve Doty came. And uh, he was pretty upset at Steve's preaching. And so um, myself and another guy met with him, this, uh, and he was pretty upset. And I said, well, he said, what's all this talk about glory? What, what's the point? And I said, well, that's the glory is where the power is. He said, look it. Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, he was resurrected. After that, who cares? Okay, now he would not be untypical. He, he's, not, he's, he's not out of range for a lot of guys, is my point. Okay, so uh, first line here. So all three want to make the cross the center of gravity, and their views are fairly representative. Next line. To them, uh, glory basically means to give honor or adulation, to shine the spotlight on. Okay, you know. So if you got you know some starlet walking down the red carpet at the Emmys or the Grammys or the whatevers, you know that 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 that's what they want to make glory just be that, you know, the shine of the spotlight. You know, your 15 seconds, you know, of starlet dumb or whatever. Okay, I think starlet dumb is spelled with the D-U-M-B on the end of it. I, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I mean, 
you know, okay, you really want to depend on Lady Gaga, you know, for your information, right? I mean, and perspectives on the world. Okay, so, okay. Uh, next line. So, you know, the intensity of the battle here just shows how ferocious the warfare of the flesh versus the spirit is. See, remember in Romans chapter 8, it talks about how the spirit, you know, well, Galatians chapter 5 talks about the spirit is against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit, and the two are contrary to one another. You don't get to do what you want to do. Slight paraphrase there. In Romans chapter 8, it says the mindset on the flesh is hostile. Hostile. Now, it may, it may cover it's, it's that hostility with a smiling countenance and a friendly handshake, but it's still hostile. Okay, and you've got to recognize that it is. You know, and it can be inside the churches. You know, just, just being baptized into Christ doesn't mean a person is spiritually minded. Okay, Nick? Maybe I'm off in the weeds here. Um, Right? <laughs> uh, looking at that, glory basically means to give honor, adoration to, shine a light. So they, they see a difference in God's glory, his backside from Moses, and glory for Jesus. Well, I'm not sure they even think that deep, Nick. Okay. <laughs> but you weren't in the weeds. <laughs> Good. That's, that's a great point, though. I mean... Uh, obviously, Moses didn't see the full glory. Okay? Uh, I, I couldn't. If he saw the full glory, he'd been vaporized. So with the material creation, great point. Bill? Well, you know, the point that people get is they make it an either-or thing, and that's where uh, people who are not being honest usually do that because it really is both because, you know, obviously, you know, seeing the trail and edge of his glory and, and, you know, when he would see the Lord, he would shine. Obviously, it was that, but also when the Lord declared his glory, he, he declared honorable things when he, when he made his name, when he declared his name. So, so there are, there are, uh, both of those are true, only a person who's trying to, to prove an argument with focus on the one, you know. Absolutely. It says right here that all you have to do is believe. Yeah. yeah. See, I mean, it's the same, same technique over and over again. Well, I just want to throw uh, a scripture out of John chapter 15 at you here for just a second. Okay, we're going to give, talk about giving glory and adulation and honor and respect and everything. And so this is be our part then in John 15 and uh, verse 11, 11, 11, okay. <laughs> John 15, verse 11, okay. He says, uh, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, that you, your joy may be full. So he really wants us to have the joy in this participation. Now look at verse 8. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. <coughs> That's got nothing to do with put, gra putting a microphone in your hand <laughs> and singing, you know, some praise chorus, you know. I mean, see how that gets so out of whack. I mean, this uh, bearing much fruit, that sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it? Yeah. So it's a lot easier to grab a microphone, you know, and uh, well, he's the only guy with a microphone. <laughs> but uh, see, so that's that's. You know, that, that's where our, our world is, and that's, you know, they, the, the real work. The problem is for us to really participate in the glory that's talking about is going to require work on our part. Jesus is going to do the heavy, heavy lifting. We're going to have to do our lifting in order to make it work. And the fact that we've got to do our lifting, that's what makes this ultimately a problem.